I'm with Richard Leiter, best-selling author, lecturer, and life coach. We've been exploring some of his concepts that he has forwarded in his work over all these years. You're also a world traveler, my friend. Yes. Africa being a focal point. Yep. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, I fell in love with Africa back in the early 80s, and I've been spending roughly a month a year in Africa for the last three decades. And uh, why? I don't know exactly. There's something about, they say, once you go to Africa, if you go into the bush and really experience Africa, once bitten, not literally, figuratively, you always want to go back uh, again. And it's true for me. I fell in love with the people. And um, Africa for me is a source experience, not a homogenized you know, tour. You go out, take pictures, go to the hotel. I get into the bush with my guide partner and others and take groups w once a year, a dozen people on a now a walking safari where we camp, you know, kind of high-end camping, but we take walks out into the villages and things. And, and I call it, the, the uh, trip title is Back to the Rhythm. Back to the Rhythm. Yeah. And people always say, what's this Back to the Rhythm thing? I mean, even people who are interested in going say, Back to the Rhythm, tell me a little bit about that. And I said, you know, it's really hard to explain, but it's a source experience. What would it be like for you if you were in a situation with no wristwatch, no cell phone, no computer, off the grid for a period of, of time? When you get there, oftentimes I, I, I tell people or ask people, tell me when you, get, when you got back to the rhythm. And it takes them at least three or four days. All of a sudden, where they really settle in, they settle into their bodies, they settle into the space, the place, they start to notice, become more aware of things around them because they're not filled with distractions. So back to the rhythm is, is not only back to nature and back to the natural earth and order of things and rhythm of, of the, uh, you know, go to bed when it's dark and get up when it's light and uh, things like this, but it's back to the core, back to the rhythm, back to your rhythm in certain ways. So uh, it's so profound for people that I have to do a session, a major session at the end of the trip, at the end of three weeks on re-entry because people are, are at a different level of, I'll say consciousness, which is a big word, but they're at a certain, uh, let's say awareness. They're at a different level of awareness about their life, what's important in their life, their bodies, how they feel. They're, they're so relaxed. I actually can tell within three or four days the difference in your face. All of a sudden, it's sort of, uh, you know, you got there and it's like, are we going to see this? And when are we going to do this? And all, and all that eventually quickly goes away. And your face becomes even more relaxed. Your shoulders drop. Your jaw is not as tight. It just happens without having to go to the gym or do anything like that from kind of living in a natural rhythm for a period of time. So it's like a retreat in certain ways. So re-entry is something, how am I going to take this back? How am I going to bottle this and take this back? So, Because not everybody can go to Africa, nor do they want to go to Africa. You don't have to go back to the rhythm there to do a retreat. Um, but there are certain things that I believe everybody should retreat occasionally. And um, it's just like everybody, I believe, should occasionally do a checkup, just like you do a financial checkup or a uh, medical, physical checkup, do a life checkup. So a retreat is kind of a form of a life checkup, and we ought to do them on a regular basis. Um, I wrote a book um, a while back um, on this concept. It was called Claiming Your Place at the Fire. And uh, that's another one, you know, like back to the rhythm. What is this claiming your place at the fire? Well, one of the things I noticed with tribes in Africa, and I haven't been with all tribes in Africa, but the ones that I've been with, uh, the wisest of the elders sit the closest to the fire. Not always the oldest of the elders, but the ones that really embody the stories, the wisdom, uh, things like that, sit the closest to the fire. And there's no manual, no, there's no mater d there that says you sit here and you sit here or they, it just happens naturally that way because those are the ones that they want to listen to so i came back after watching that and said well 
where's my place at the fire going to be? Am I going to be sitting, you know, what does it take to be a wise elder or to be, and it was a metaphor for, and uh, for that. And um, so I was sitting around the fire once and contemplating writing about claiming your place at the fire because this concept was so captivating to me. And I was sitting up late at night, staring in all by myself and everyone else had gone to their tents to go to bed. This is in Africa. And there were four flames flickering and, I, and it came to me, it's kind of the, the four flames of vitality or the four characteristics is what it ended up to me. And um, those four characteristics of claiming your place at the, at the fire, um, first is identity. Who are you and where are you in your, your life? And uh, uh, so that was, that's part of a, of, of a, of a checkup. And the, the next one is community. Who, is, who else is at the fire with your, you know? So these are things that can come in a, in a lot of different ways. And the third one was, was uh, passion. What is it you really care about? What is it that matters to you in terms of your interests and your curiosities? And, and the fourth was purpose. So these are things that I've written about, but in the context of a retreat, I think everybody ought to sit around the fire at certain key times in their life. Metaphorically speaking, Metaphorically of or literally. Something happens when you sit around a fire and stare into the coals or into the flames. It doesn't happen when you just, I mean, even when you light a candle, it changes the, the mood in certain ways. You're drawn to that. There's something in our DNA about sitting around fires that, uh, that is interesting. So it's a, it's a ritual, it's a symbol um, about retreat in, in many ways because something comes out of us, you know, for, Thousands of years we sat around fires at the end of the day. That was the end of the day's work, whether it was the hearth in the home or the fire in the bush or something like that where we told the stories of the days, we warmed ourselves, we cooked our food, we did. So it's, it's kind of in our DNA is what I'm, I'm saying. So back to the rhythm, claiming your face at place at the fire. Those are all things that are <clears throat> symbolic of essentially doing, doing essential retreats on a regular basis. So most people might think, or many might think about going to a retreat, oh, I, gotta, I, I don't have time. So, um, you know, or, or money, because or money. it can be pretty yeah. expensive, yeah. I suppose. And what would I do anyway on a retreat? Well, uh, so I talk about a, uh, and write about a, taking a 24-hour retreat. So most people can find a day and a night sometime. I mean, they may have to let go of something else to carve that. And one of the things is you need to be alone. Solo is what we call it, being on solo. Now, I, uh, uh, I'm a long time, I was a board member of Outward Bound. I created Outward Bound. For those that don't know what Outward Bound is, it's a, there are 88 wilderness Outward Bound schools in the world. There's only three here, and the rest are different ones on the slopes of Kilimanjaro that I visited when I was in Africa. But every one of these Outward Bound schools has something that is critical to the Outward Bound experience, whether it's an eight-day experience or a month experience, or a, they put everybody on what they call solo. Sounds solo. scary, I gotta be honest it with is. you. It is, it is scary. It doesn't have to be, but it's scary. To more, it's more scary to people than climbing or canoeing or trekking why would it be that way? Why is it so fearful to be on solo? Now, of course, on solo with Outward Bound means that they're gonna plunk you down someplace and tell you to stay within that place for 24 hours. And uh, so, and they, ch they check on you. So I, I wanna be sure to say that this is not just, you know, throw people out there to the wolves, so to speak, but uh, uh, adults in particular are fearful of, of being alone. So the question, and I, I created the first Outward Bound uh, adult course called the Life Career Renewal Course and taught it myself for five years. So I, I, I know the solo thing well, and I've taken many solos myself as well. But um, this, the question they ask is, what do you want me to do? And I said, well, I don't want you to do anything. I want you to be for 24 hours. And they stare at me like, how do you be? What, what's being? I said, well, you're going to have a journal. You'll have some 
you know, no food necessarily, but water, hydration, and uh, safety. We'll check on you every, every so often. But other than that, no talking. And um, see what comes up, see what happens. Well, what happens is that people come back after a 24-hour solo, and they'll often say, this is the best part of the experience for me. I was so fr frightened going out, and I wasn't so frightened, actually, to be honest with you, about the weather or the animals or the whatever. I just have never been alone. I haven't spent any time with myself. And your own thoughts. And your own thoughts. Yep. And, uh, and I was afraid that there was no one home. You know, what if I get out there and nothing comes out? Well, they end up making lists, like master dream lists, but they end up, what they really do is write letters of gratitude. They start thinking about what it is that they're, you know, when there's no distractions, they start to think about what really matters, what they're really grateful for, and uh, relational stuff comes up uh, big time. So a 24-hour retreat has that combination of kind of the back to the rhythm ritual of getting away in some way. Because again, it's not about going on outward bound. It's not about going to Africa. You can do this in your house, or you can do it in a space that. But, but it's a. It's got to be. A, nature is often helpful. Being in a natural setting does uh, open things up for people and and uh, gives people perspectives that on uh, life that they're. Um, and it's not all about them all the time. For example, one of the things you do on, a, on one of these solos, I just remembered, I say, take a 12-inch piece of land where you're sitting and just study that 12 inches for, you know, 30 minutes or an hour. And they look at me like, huh? Then when they do it, though, they say, I couldn't believe how much was going on there. How much was not, and I said, that's a metaphor for what we don't notice what's going on in our lives. It's a lot going on around us. And so slowing it down, pausing, solo. So a 24-hour retreat is, is, is about a solo. And, and it's, it's really flipping the mindset in certain ways. A lot of people live with this kind of a mindset. I call it, there's three words, having, doing, and being. If I have enough, the time will, usually money or security, the time will come when I can do what I want to do. I'll have the freedom, I'll have the time or the resources to do what I want to do. And when I'm doing what I want to do, I'll be happy, right? So don't a lot of people kind of live with that model of, in life? Like some, the day will come when I don't have to work and I'll be free and I can do what I want to do. Well, what you do in a solo is you, is you turn it around. You know, the old notion of the, the unexamined life. Well, the examined life is the only life worth living, really, ultimately. Because that's your life. That's your choices. That's your priorities. So when you flip the model around, you start with being, and then look at doing, and then look at having, it really changes the game in, in many ways. And what the point of that is, is that you're looking from the inside out rather than outside in. So the being part is, well, who am I? What do I really want? What are my priorities? What is my purpose? You know, all those kinds of things that I, are my stock and trade for what I try to help pe people with. And then what am I doing to live that? Am I living me? Am I doing me or am I being me or am I doing somebody else's vision of the good life or of their life? And what they come up with is that if I'm doing me, I'll have a rich life. In other words, I'll have a life that I want. I won't end up postponing it or thing, things like that. So when people do a 24-hour retreat, the, the first thing is I say you have to find a place where you can be uh, with no technology and no distractions for 24 hours. Mm, that's tough. It's tough, but it can be done. You can figure it out in certain, certain ways. And you can do it right where you are, and nature, as I said, would be, be a good thing. And then, how do you spend that time? Well, this may sound really, uh, it's so simplistic that it's, that it's weird. Start by paying attention to just your breathing. One of the things people don't really notice, because they're so busy, 
if they don't retreat, even if they retreat for an hour, they could, they could do this, is that a lot of their breathing is up here. It's like uptight, you know, because they're so, and you notice that the great athletes, children, when you go to sleep or when you're really in the zone doing things you love, where do you breathe? From here, from down here. So one of the things that I have people start to do is to learn how to take three deep breaths. Now this sounds kind of strange, doesn't it? To learn how to take three deep breaths. Consciously. So this is one of the most simple things, but practical things. And that is when you take three deep breaths, if we did that right now, maybe we should. Let's do it. Let's try Cleansing it. breaths. Okay. I, I'll go with you. Yeah, just, just take three deep ones. <sighs> now for me, it's a little strange doing it here on camera, but I could notice it drop, my center of gravity dropped down. What happens when you're breathing up here is your brain's going like, you know, you're, it's part of the busyness, your breath. When you drop, and it only, the science of breath is that it only takes three to really slow the brain down. So the start of a retreat is to learn to breathe. Hmm. To just, and every so often, when you're at home, by the way, not on retreat, and you're working, or you're at work working, and you're feeling like da-da-da, and you're on air, to stop, take three deep breaths if you can during a break, and all of a sudden you're back to the center. So a 24-hour retreat is about centering, starting with the body, then the mind, then the spirit, inside out. So it seems simple enough. It does. But when in a world of hurry, sickness, and busyness, going on retreat like, like, like that, starting just, oh boy, so it feels good just to it breathe. Feels, it does all of a feel sudden. good. And it becomes a practice, by the way. For me, that, that's a centering practice. When you come up to a stoplight, for example, and you're driving, and you're trying to get somewhere, forget it. Take three deep breaths. Use the stoplight as your, your 30 second retreat center. All of a sudden when it becomes a practice, you stay centered uh, uh, often. So the starting point for the retreat is, is just learning to relax because oftentimes people go on retreat and they're just as busy doing this and doing that and straightening things up or um, you know, checking their watch or, you know, doing it. And I said, first thing is just to get comfortable in your own skin, in your own body. So that's why you need to find a place where there aren't any, any distractions. Then you start to look at, well, what do I, what's the, what's the point of the exercise? What do I want to come out of this with? Because, you know, most people don't want a result. They don't want to just go away for the sake of relaxation. So the result for me that I teach is to write a purpose statement. So now there are steps into that, but the result is to come out of it with some sort of a statement about what you want the next phase, the purpose and next phase of your life to be. So there's certain exercises that you, you may do. Back to Africa, back to the rhythm for, for, for a moment. Um, we do this as part of that process there. However, um, every afternoon we take a solo. I mean, we're talking about being out in the bush and da da da. And so after we hiked and everything, we're back in camp and everything, it's like time out for kids, it's time out for adults, it's taking a solo. And people so look forward to that solo time. Huh. Just because it's unnatural to the way we're living. It really and yet is. It's natural to our bodies. And so with our minds, the next step is what are the questions that I, I need to deal with? So there's many, many ways into those questions. But the first thing I have people do is look at time. And I have them calculate about how long they expect to live. Well, that's a question. Now there's a question. So, you know, we do something called the life spiral. And spiral looks like a life that looks like this goes through many triggering events and moments and and uh, but it, down at the bottom of the spiral is birth so i have people write in their date of birth and up at the top i have them write in about how old they'll live to be and then i have them put an x about where they are now so on my life spiral for example i've got 95 
which is very optimistic. And the future's not promised to anybody. We don't know, but that's what I'm shooting for. And uh, my family history would not point to that, but my lifestyle might, and that's, I'm optimistic. I'm 71, so on my spiral, I'm, my ex is up here. So I got this much time left to live. This is my story back here. This is the life I've lived. This is what I've learned. This is what I've experienced. So I'm at this inflection point, this retreat point, where I'm saying, what do I want next in my life? And who do I want to be with next? So the whole good life thing, place, people, right work, purpose, those, those kinds of, th of questions. And I have people do a, a good life inventory. They actually take uh, and score themselves on a good life inventory of a number of questions, and it, wow, it really op opens up the game in, in a lot of ways. And from that, then they start to write a purpose statement, and uh, they come back from that saying, you know, I ought to do this every year. And that's what you suggest, regular check-ins in retreat. Yeah. I actually say this, you ought to do it every day, five minutes a day. You ought to do a five-minute retreat every day, but once a year, a 24-hour one. Good advice. Yeah. Richard Leiter, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you, Kathy.